At Camp Huachuca in southeast Arizona, soldiers would frequently ask prospector Edward Shefflin if he had discovered any rich ore in the area. Shefflin would respond optimistically, saying that he would eventually find something. At least once, he was told that the only thing he would find would be his own tombstone. The word would linger in his mind. When Shefflin found silver on August 1st, 1877, he named his discovery the Tombstone Mine. When he found more silver in another location, he named it the Graveyard. On April 5th, 1878, the Tombstone Mining District was organized. Two of the founders were Ed Shefflin and his brother, Albert. A local town would be necessary as more of the land in the area became developed for mining operations. Plans began for a town built on a flat mesa known as Goose Flats, and the name for this settlement would be none other than Tombstone. In March of 1879, the Tombstone town site claim was drawn up, and the town site was properly surveyed. By September, town lots began to be sold at good prices. Business after business moved in, and the wild frontier town of Tombstone began to take shape. In early January of 1880, a special correspondent of the Chicago Tribune, who only went by the initial N, traveled to Tombstone. The correspondent wrote of his experiences, and it was published in the newspaper. This article was how many people first heard of the new mining town in Arizona. It was published on February the 7th with the headline, Arizona, a visit to Tombstone City, the new great mining camp. Aspects of of life in that lively town, bar rooms, kino, and varieties. The principal neighboring mines, Tough Nut, Contention, Lucky Cuss, and others. Special correspondents of the Chicago Tribune. Tucson, Arizona, January 5th. To visit Tombstone, the new great mining camp of doleful cognomen but lively characteristics, is the recognized duty of everyone exploring, investigating, or interested in Arizona this new field of American enterprise. So, of course, I went to see and judge for myself, for many men have many minds. Tombstone is 75 miles from Tucson, in a southerly direction, and there are two lines of coaches on the road, which, contesting with each other, have reduced the fare to a very low figure, to the great thankfulness of the general public who can now travel for $4 where they recently had to pay $10 and this very day I hear it has been reduced to $3. And there are persons who say that passengers will probably yet be taken for nothing and given their dinner free until one or the other company collapses, when the weakened survivor with a grim smile will no doubt put the fare up to $10 again. For such is stage life. The road to Tombstone is good for a new country and for natural roads. The 75 miles are made in about 11 hours. All the glorious effect of free trade and competition, for they formerly took about 24. At times it is dusty, and my fellow passengers' tobacco smoke, three of them inside the coach, smoking like steam engines, is not delightful. But all are good-natured and full of information, and I live through it. Mark McDonald, the Ursus Major of the San Francisco Stock Board, Senator Luttrell, and other lions are also traveling to see these eccentrically named mines. The Lucky Cuss, Tough Nut, Contention, etc., which said mines with others are now attracting almost national attention. Much of the road is over barren, uninviting country. The mountains in the distance everywhere are, however, all more or less mineral-bearing. But part of the road is through park-like country, oak and mesquite trees, with miles upon miles of the finest type of grass, extending to and up the mountainsides. Water is generally scarce, but with the digging of wells, the great pastoral facilities of the higher lands can be readily utilized. This is nearly midwinter, and the climate is delightful, cool in the morning and evening, rendering a little fire acceptable, but no snow, ice, or really cold weather. We reach Tombstone City. Stiff and dusty, we alight, and a crowd at the hotel look curiously on to note the new arrivals. A good square meal, considering it is this country, to use a common local expression, and we feel refreshed. 
And, the mantle of night having fallen, we start out and around to see the sights. On the principal street lined with adobe buildings, large tents, and frame structures, we find nearly every other building is a saloon. Some are empty, and the whiskey business is at present evidently overdone. Some are full of rough-looking men, miners and others, with quite a sprinkling of red-nosed, bloated-looking gentry, plainly belonging to the ancient order of the mining camp bummer, who lives on free drinks, dollars borrowed from genuine miners, and an occasional mining location that he stumbles across, and sells as soon as he can to spend the proceeds in whiskey and gambling, until, used up and exhausted, he pays the last debt of nature, the only debt he ever does pay, and is finally buried at the public expense, or by a local subscription. Gambling is in full blast, and the monotonous calling of numbers with the occasional cry of Kino! in a stifling atmosphere of stove heat, unwashed humanity, whiskey fumes, and a cloud of tobacco smoke in the midst of the crowd is soon sufficiently satisfying to induce retreat, and the sweet air of heaven on emerging is so refreshing that it sets a person wondering where the fun comes in to induce men to work like horses, only to spend their money in such places, as so many foolish, hard-working, yet honest-meaning miners do. The genuine, typical miner is honest, open-hearted, strong, fearless, and brave. As a class, fine specimens of manhood, fully of enterprise, and with a heart that readily sympathizes with the sorrows of others, and a hand equally free to relieve. But all miners are not such. Reckless, debauched, and depraved men are amongst them, with instincts utterly low and debased. And the less people have to do with such men, the better. They float on the wave, and when they become too well known in one camp, they move to another, and are the sticks, straws, and scum borne onward by the rising human tide. An illuminated sign marked varieties, and the sounds of dance music attract us elsewhere and we enter a very large frame tent, probably a hundred feet long. A liquor bar is on one side and several tables for gambling on the other, but business does not appear to be very brisk. The crowd is a motley one, mingled Mexican and white, mostly dirty and ill-dressed, and some half-drunk. The crowd is more interesting as a study of certain phases of humanity than attractive. Amongst the crowd are a few persons attracted by curiosity, looking quietly on but it is a dangerous place for the men fond of liquor or inclined to gamble. The music is from a room at the far end of the structure, where four women and several men are dancing, or rather stumbling and rolling through a quadrille. The atmosphere is dusty and abominable, but they dance away nevertheless, the men inanely grinning, the women evidently dancing as a matter of business. It is work to them. It is the way they live. They had better die. Two are white. Two are Mexican. One of the white women looks old and worn, dancing with evident effort. All are homely, and with the evidences of worthlessness, worn-out tawdriness, and probably disease that they present, form a ghastly picture of a low type of immorality. When daylight comes, we note the city more particularly. Adobe buildings are going up in every direction. Stocks of goods are arriving. Nice-looking stores are being fitted up. The newspaper office, The Nugget, is here already, publishing a lively paper. There are two drug stores, three or four physicians, several lawyers, and more people coming. And it looks as if they were coming to stay, for the improvements, though not of marble or with brownstone fronts, are durable and intended to be permanent. Tombstone will grow. Nearer to Sonora than Tucson by 75 miles... It, or Charleston on the San Pedro, is where the mills are situated, is bound to receive a portion of the Sonora trade, now worth to Tucson from $1,500,000 to $2,000,000 annually, to say nothing of local requirements and that of surrounding mineral districts. Still, Tombstone is not a very attractive place, either in name or appearance. The city fathers can soon amend the name, but it is windy and dusty, scantily supplied with water, with no trees to break the landscape, and it would not attract the painter or artist, 
except from the very absence of such advantages, yet it will probably be found healthy, the zephyrs not so strong as those of Washoe, and good minds and appropriate position will build a town more quickly than sylvan scenes. The mines around, too, are not on the surface very attractive, even to the prospector. The mineral outcrop generally is poor and dubious looking, but a few feet of sinking on doubtful locations have developed rich ores, surprising in quantity and quality. So true is this that mines there, today valued at hundreds of thousands if not millions of dollars, have been thought not worth locating. A fellow traveler told me that, though he had himself the opportunity, he did not then think it worth his while to locate the ground on which one or two of the principal mines are now found to be situated. The old adage that appearances, whether for good or evil, are often deceitful, has thus met with one more illustration. Doubtless, the prospectors who did at last make the locations, and bestowed on them the ironical names they bear, little dreamt of the life to spring so speedily into existence. And even now, though the spell of silence is broken and the new existence fairly born, we cannot see much more clearly. But the changes time brings are wonderful. And in these days, more than the events of an olden century are being crowded into a decade. N. The correspondent had written, The city fathers can soon amend the name, but it is windy and dusty, scantily supplied with water, with no trees to break the landscape, and it would not attract the painter or artist, except from the very absence of such advantages. The name of the town stuck, and those who live there are proud of calling their home Tombstone. As to the correspondent's opinion that the landscape would not attract the painter or artist, the beauty of Cochise County has inspired many paintings and captivated many photographers. The town even has the Tombstone Art Gallery, where the work of artisans who live in Cochise County, Arizona, is proudly displayed.